Great, thanks very much, Ben, and thank you very much, everyone, for being here. I'm Mike Esbester, uh, one of the team who put this uh, presentation and, and the research project together. Um, I've got, I'm a historian with an interest in occupational safety and health from the late 19th century onwards in Britain, um, really thinking about things like safety, education, persuasion, and the idea of preventing accidents. Uh, and my name is Paul Armand. Uh, I'm a professor of law here at the University of Reading. Uh, my research interests are particularly around regulation, criminal law, and in particular the kind of policy making context around health and safety regulation uh, uh, over the last sort of 50 years or so. So, to give you some wider context about our project, uh, the changing legitimacy of health and safety at work, 1960 to 2015. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is part of the IOSH research program and obviously we're very grateful to them for supporting our project and the others. Uh, there are six projects in total representing an investment of 1.4 million pounds, which is quite substantial. The aims of the research program were to be agenda setting and to produce some recommendations to inform practice and that's some of what we're going to be discussing today from our projects uh, relates to that. Just to give you a little bit uh, more about where you can find some more details of the uh, conclusions of the report that, uh, for our project. Uh, some details on the slide here. You'll be receiving a copy of the presentation afterwards. You don't need to make a note of this, but if you do want to find out more, we'd thoroughly recommend you uh, trying to get hold of some of these copies, particularly the project report, which is available for free from the IOSH website. So, the uh to give you an overview, our project is one which was uh, designed to look at the question of the changing legitimacy of health and safety at work from 1960 to 2015. Um, it was part of that overarching project and the one that perhaps more than the others had a focus on context and background and interaction between health and safety and the wider uh, world. Um, we did that in a multidisciplinary way because often using multiple methods of investigation means that you can really check different sources and, uh, and types of information against each other to get a much fuller and more reliable picture about change over time. And particularly when you're talking about people's recollections of the past and their thoughts about the future, uh, it can be quite useful to, to try and back that up with other sources. So I obviously was drawing on my background in, in socio-legal studies and law. And I was drawing on my background in history. Uh, a question that some of you may rightly be thinking at this stage is, well, why is the past, particularly what seems like the, the long distant past, relevant to us? Why should I be interested in this? Um, hopefully we'll go through some of that today, but also to come to, to sell at the outset, this is the basis of where we are today, the basis of the present. We can see how we've got to where we've got to, we can see how issues have been tackled in the past, uh, which may suggest avenues to explore for the present, or indeed to avoid the present. Uh, the other thing that we were able to draw on, uh, along with some of the other methods, was uh, in particular insights from uh, a team based at the Institute of Work, Health and Organisations at the University of Nottingham, who are psychologists. So uh, that gave us also uh, an insight into public attitude data and information. So we used multiple methodologies as I've said, we investigated public attitudes, but also uh, carried out a literature review and policy analysis of the area of health and safety. We carried out a series of interviews with key policy actors who were drawn from a very wide range of backgrounds. Uh, they range from former uh, health and safety commission chairs and director generals of HSE, uh, through MPs and members of the House of Lords, through trade union leaders, uh, employers, uh, activists uh, and are many other people with many different uh, interests in the field and we brought all of that data together. That was quite important to do because one of the things that we might not get from the archival side of things, so these are the, the documents that were produced at the time, is uh, a record of the, the processes by which decisions were reached. So the archival work uh, which I was responsible for investigated what we had as a kind of the written records and minutes of meetings, various state papers, be it reports um, of bodies like the HSE, um, also organisations like the National Coal Board, British Rail, um, 
We also investigated what uh, trade unions have produced and where they discussed issues related to health and safety and organisations like IOSH, the British Safety Council, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents. So uh, to kind of bring us around to the key question that we'd asked and, and what our, our research focus was, um, we were tasked with answering the, quest, the question really, is this a time of crisis for health and safety? Uh, has something fundamental changed in the way that people think about it? Uh, I think uh, a question had been opened up for you to contribute to while we were just getting started. Um, I don't know if there's results available uh, on that first uh, question that, that, that went out or not about uh, how you perceive social attitudes towards health and safety to have changed in the last five to ten years. Uh, uh, just stepping in there, sorry, apologies, Paul. I, I hadn't actually launched the poll at that point. Uh, I've just launched it now, um, so we're just uh, getting some some uh, answers in now. No problem. Well, the, what prompted the, the the project was really the perception that things had got much worse in this regard, um, and certainly the political context over the last ten years or so. Um, if we think about the Young Review, the Lofsted Review, the Red Tape Challenge, some of the comments that the former Prime Minister made when in opposition, um, uh, cuts that have been made to the operating budgets of HSE and local authorities, and it, uh, the media coverage that health and safety has received, you know, stories about children having to wear goggles to play conkers at school, all seem to contribute to this perception uh, that attitudes across society have got much worse. Uh, and when we think about this in a theoretical way, at least, um, we tend to talk about this in terms of questions of legitimacy. Um, so uh, I'll just see if there's any results on, on what your perceptions of change over time look like in terms of social attitude. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just uh, just a couple more coming in, but I'll uh, I'll end the poll there then because we've got quite a vast majority. Um, so you should now be able to see uh, the results on your screen. Yeah, interesting. So overall, I think broadly, it looks like that's 57% who who see it as becoming either a little or a bit more critical or hostile over time. It's interesting actually because. This is always tempered by an awareness and understanding that actually health and safety probably is more widespread and permeates people's lives a lot more than it did in the past. But at the same time, what people say about it or what people think about it when you ask them might be slightly more critical. So when we think about the idea of legitimacy, what we're talking about essentially are the perceptions or judgments that people make about an area of practice or the people who do it. Um, and four key questions really, uh, really filter into that. Uh, the first one, uh, has, uh, is the uh, activity that we're talking about, in this case, health and safety generally, uh, is it lawful? Secondly, is it accountable? Do people feel represented by it? Thirdly, does it work? Is it necessary and effective? And lastly, is it fair? does it achieve the kind of outcomes that we would really want it to achieve? So in this one, we were interested in taking a longer view. So not just that this is something that is a, a potential issue of the last five, 10, 15 years, but going back further to really try and get a handle on whether public, if public attitudes have changed, and if so, how. Um, to this, perceptions are key, so what people are thinking. So we want to know, is this critical attitude that we might be seeing anything new? Is it somehow different to what's happened in the past 60 years or so? If it is difficult, how and what ways? And of course, what does all this mean? So uh, I might just ask there uh, if it's possible, I think the second question uh, can go out uh, for people to think about and answer now, which is about the greatest barriers that you encounter to getting the message across. Uh, while, we, uh, while that's uh, going on, I'll just run through uh, the different areas that we looked at in our report, of which there were about 14. Um, they're broadly gr grouped under these four headings, which relate to those four questions that I just mentioned. So the first one, constitutional, their issues about, is it legal? Are people following the rules? Uh, are the rules uh, appropriate in the way that they're made and what they cover? Um, uh, is there a, a, an appropriate sense that uh, things are being done 
uh, fairly and uh, accurately and appropriately. So the second theme, theme that you can see, the democratic one, uh, really relates, those, those are three bullet points, relates to questions about who is being represented um, and how complete the coverage uh, may be. The third category you can see there, functional, really is, is thinking about, well, how does it work on the ground? How effective is health and safety, for example? How efficient is its practice? Uh, and the last one, justice, relates to that question of fairness. Is it being done for the right reasons? Uh, are people's motives for doing it uh, the ones that we would want them to have? All 14 of these constitute sections of our written report, which is available on the Irish website. So if any of them interest you in particular, you can dip into that report and look at them. Or if you want to see uh, across the full spread of them, uh, then you can read them all uh, as you go along. Um, if it's possible, just uh, maybe get a sense of the results of that second question now. Um, yeah, of course, not a problem. That and, and see what people said. Broadly speaking, then, it seems that the two standout areas perhaps are a uh, lack of engagement on the part of colleagues uh, and a lack of support or prioritisation within the organisation. So within the organisation, we're talking uh, in a way about issues that are constitutional to some degree. Uh, is there a, 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 an appropriate background? Uh, is it supported? Are there rules in place? Is it invested in so on and so forth? And when we talk about involvement or engagement, we're talking mainly there about the democratic kind of headings. Whose voice is heard? Um, uh, who plays a part uh, in uh, thinking about health and safety? So both of those things kind of map onto the, the elements of legitimacy that we were looking at within our project. So we've picked out a number of key themes that emerged from the, the project that we hope will be of interest to you today. And one of them perhaps is actually quite surprising. I think surprised us when we started looking into this. Um, but the stability of health and safety. Um, there have been continued challenges, certainly uh, over the last 60 years, the period that we're looking at, but actually stretching back far further than that. One of them, for example, would be over the appropriate role for the state. This is uh, an emerging question in the 19th century. But we see it playing through the 20th century into the 1960s, where, which, generally speaking, was kind of quite conflictual in the relations that are going on, and particularly thinking about what the state should be doing. 1970s becoming slightly more consensual, and then again, 1980s returned to a slightly more conflictual way of thinking. And again, we get start to get uh, discussion here amongst government about things like red tape coming up, with, for example, as part of a 1985 white paper lifting the burden. And again, it talks specifically about health and safety there. So we get some sense of these, these rooted questions going back quite a long, a long way. Um, and again, it, as we already discussed, we get into the 2000s and we start to see a uh, period of challenge, increasing media and political hostility. But this is a key point about the stability. Actually, despite these challenges, the stakeholders over the, these years have, by and large, really bought into the idea that health and safety is actually an essentially a useful thing. Um, since 1974, we've had a remarkably stable regulatory system. Um, and generally speaking, the HSE has been well regarded. It's worth saying that the picture there that we've got to ah. represent that stability uh, is, of course, uh, an archive photo of the Robins Committee sitting between 1970 and 72. Lord Alfred Robins in the middle of the picture the rest of the committee there. It's quite rare, I think, to, to actually visually see them uh, as an organisation compared to how much we talk about them and their, their enduring influence. Uh, the second thing that I was going to mention, uh, or that was particularly interesting, I think is about uh, health and safety as a political football. Um, we are aware, I think, and, and probably experience quite a lot with the degree of perhaps irritation uh, the way in which politicians might seize upon health and safety uh, as a symbolic issue that they might like to kick around from time to time and criticise. Um, and certainly there are many examples of that, not just in the last 10 years or so, but going back all the way through the period of our study. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that the use of it as a political football cuts both ways and is actually quite limited because health and safety was set up from the very outset to have a life of its own beyond central government. 
That's why you have HSE as a non-departmental public body. That's why you have the tripartite system of the Health and Safety Commission. Uh, that's why it's set up through systems of guidance and self-regulatory principles that mean that a lot of what is done is actually done way beyond the reach of politicians. So it's insulated from interference to, to some degree. However much politicians badmouth health and safety, the amount of actual concrete change that they produce is often much less uh, than, uh, than that might suggest. There's more, uh, more noise than, than light uh, is generated. And the other thing, of course, and I've got the example there of, of George Osborne, who during his time was known as the, uh, the Dayglow Chancellor, the high vis Chancellor, because he actually kind of was very keen to be seen in a hard hat and a, and a jacket visiting building sites because health and safety actually there was a tool for him to show you know we are a government that gets things done we're building for the future so health and safety can sometimes be useful for politicians um, as a, a, a tool just as a, an example a bit of how health and safety has got this life of its own um, I'd like to take us back to the, the 1980s and got the Conservative government coming in, which is opposed famously to, to state regulation, including health and safety, particularly interested in there are a number of, of early attempts to um, curb the HSE as they see it. But there's a limited amount that the Thatcher government is actually successful in doing, um, partly because of a run of disasters in the late 1980s. Things like King's Cross, the Herald of Free Enterprise, Piper Alpha, Clapham Junction and Hillsborough, all of which really increase public scrutiny and people see the necessity for health and safety. So the government's ability to act and to, to try and cut health and safety action is limited in this way. Um, it's an interesting, one of our interviewees, Frank Doran, MP, uh, said, recalled, for virtually all of Margaret Thatcher's governments, I think they probably would have liked to have done things with the Health and Safety at Work Act, but there were so many disasters, it was difficult. So here we've got uh, a way that the kind of health and safety is politicised, but in a way that actually helps to, to reinforce the good that health and safety does. And tragically, of course, the issue of health and safety and regulation um, uh, is something that we're thinking about again this week following the, the, the Grenfell Tower fire earlier in, in West London. Uh, again, what that will be interesting in the future is seeing how the pressures that that places on government interact perhaps with those uh, that are involved around the Brexit process in deciding what kind uh, of society we want in the future. The third thing that we're going to just mention and, and focus in on uh, is a sense that sometimes uh, as an area, as a body of law, health and safety, it seems, just can't win uh, and to some degree what we see is this sort of double movement that some that sometimes happens with reform and with change that is that when you make a positive change or introduce something new uh, even if it's highly effective it can also bring quite negative perceptions so that it's seen as both a good and a bad thing at the same time so uh, one example of this uh, that recurred throughout the the project was a sense that because our health and safety regime is largely uh, based on self-regulatory principles, because it places a lot of responsibility for things like uh, risk assessments and safety management onto duty holders, that actually uh, should be freeing. It should be liberating. But at the same time, it, it was also fingered by many people, regulators and others, as a factor that sometimes led to this kind of culture of self-censure, of people placing obligations upon themselves of limiting what they did. Um, so, and of course they're able to do that because they have the freedom to decide how to manage the risks in their own workplace. So the, the phrase blue tape has come to the fore in recent years to describe those self-imposed or mutually imposed obligations that don't necessarily come from the regulations or the law themselves. That idea about uh, the self-regulation and uh, the ability to impose one's own duties has then led to this, this question about the, the flexibility being seen rather than as a positive, uh, potentially as a negative, because it means that there are variations from workplace to workplace, um, which is in some respects a good thing. It's reactive, responsive to what's going on on the ground, but it does mean that it's very difficult for people to have certainty about what's they should or shouldn't be doing, they think they should or shouldn't be doing. 
Um, we see this playing out then in questions about who decides what is reasonably practical. Um, again, something that's been debated and discussed since the introduction of this idea in the 70s, really. Um, so we had a, a nice example from the early 1980s when uh, manufacturing industry uh, meeting, so the, the manufacturers decided it wasn't reasonably practical to introduce the noise levels that the trade unions were asking for, uh, as, as they said, the industry could not afford to re-equip in order to meet the unrealistic noise levels. Um, so we have this debate then about well, who, who's deciding what should be done or shouldn't be done. Um, this also has opened up in really in the 1990s, late 1980s, 1990s onwards, this idea that uh, health and safety is moving into new areas, uh, which in some people's views are going further than if they ought to. So responding really to the changing nature of work. Um, a key example here is display screen equipment, part of the, the 1992 six pack regulations, the, the European uh, display screen equipment regs, is a point where many people encounter health and safety. But as um, one former factory inspector and uh, HSE uh, senior official said, it's a big step to say that every individual workstation must be properly assessed by a competent person. That impacts on more or less everyone at work. And people think, fuck this health and safety, it's a real pain. I just want to get on with my job. So we have this, this real kind of dilemma, this is the point at which people are in contact with it, and it's seen as being disproportionate, going too far. That similarly applies to other areas, stress, psychosocial risks, um, which some people, politicians, sometimes have seen as, as really kind of soft issues that are very, they're very suspicious about it. Um, they seem to think these things are about shirking and not to do with genuine health risks. So pushing health and safety into these areas has brought problems as well as trying to reach many more people. The last theme was the one that kind of spirals us back in a way to, to where we began with the first question that we posed. What do the public actually think about health and safety? What are their attitudes? Um, what we found overall, and this was based on multiple different uh, sources of information and different methods that we used, uh, is that actually public views on health and safety, it's really hard to say that there's a single direction of travel um, or a single uh, way in which they've changed. In fact, uh, broadly, uh, we would say overall, perceptions of health and safety have remained remarkably stable over time. Uh, within those uh, attitudes, you tend to get two countervailing streams. And we could think about these as the difference between opinions and attitudes. So opinions are generally held to be your kind of reflex, instinctive, top of the head response. And when you say to people, as we did in the focus groups that we ran, what comes to mind when you think of health and safety? They say, oh, jobs were boring, uh, you know, interfering, red tape, rubbish, whatever. But when you actually probe with people, you know, what do you think really matters in terms of uh, your workplace or the way that you relate to the people who work around you, there's an underlying acceptance that people want to be safe, that they believe uh, in the idea of a right to safety, um, that they accept in general uh, the need to have health and safety in their workplaces uh, and the people who do it uh, when they engage with them uh, are generally trusted. Uh, and a phrase that's used to describe this is that of critical trust people will say, well, I don't necessarily like health and safety reps in my office or health and safety advisors coming around and interfering or telling me what to do. I don't like having policies there that, that interfere with my day-to-day uh, my -day life, but I know that it's important, so I'll go along with it. And you know that, that, I think, cuts against what we might read in the media, which tends perhaps to focus more on the opinions and a bit less on those attitudes so overall, in terms of public attitudes, one of the phrases that we, we put in uh, to our report as a, as a summary was don't panic. You know, have some trust or some belief that actually things are not as bad as the worst case scenario. Uh, and underneath it, there's a more widespread acceptance than we might otherwise uh, think. The last theme is the one we're going to kind of focus the rest of the presentation on. That's around communication because it's one with multiple kind of elements to it. Uh, I think the third question that we posed in advance, um, if that can be launched now for people to, to participate in, because it asks about 
uh, how you categorize attitudes uh, of your colleagues, clients, employees, or the people you work with towards health and safety. Um, communication came through really importantly as a recurring feature across all of those areas and all of those themes that we investigated. We found in particular, there's a recurring difficulty in getting the message across about health and safety, and that occurs at all kinds of different levels. Uh, it's an important area. It's very easy to talk in very technical terms about it, but it's perhaps very hard sometimes to get across the message that you really want, which might be about values rather than, uh, rather than technicalities. So in workplaces, for instance, there are some aspects of communication that are relatively easy and relatively well established. So the introduction, for instance, of the uh, visual display posters uh, the 1974 Act required, which have to be there in every workplace. Um, information that is clear, useful, tailored, and not generic. All these things are relatively kind of common sense in terms of thinking about communication and getting a message across. But that message is mainly one that is factual. What's a bit harder can be to get a message across about commitment and engagement and ownership. That's much tougher. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of literature and evidence that establishes that these are really centrally important to good performance, not just having information, but communicating about why that information matters. At a social level as well, there are these important concerns or queries about communication. Do people have input into policy? Uh, are the values about why health and safety matters, that idea of the right to safety, uh, are they really represented uh, in political debate? Is there a positive media message being put across or not? The message here uh, can be uh, quite difficult. One good example of that was the recent red tape challenge that was undertaken uh, between, I think, 2010 and, and 2012 by the government through the Cabinet Office. This asked for people's views about red, red tape, and in particular it focused on health and safety, but as a process of communication, it had a lot of drawbacks to it. It was a bit superficial, a bit flippant, a bit negative in the way that it was uh, set up and staged. Um, there's a need probably at a social level for us to communicate much better, and often in workplaces, a need for us to communicate much better, or at least differently. So the rest of the, of the uh, presentation kind of focuses on issues of communication. Um, as I flip to the next slide, if we can see if there's results from that third question, that third poll available, to see what people think about uh, generally the attitudes that you encounter day to day. Uh, po <clears throat> apologies, Paul, I thought that we were launching the poll on this actual slide, so I haven't uh, actually launched it. No worries, it. well, we'll carry on talking and people can keep filling it in. That's okay, I've, uh, I've launched it now, so it's uh, so right. once we've got the vote, so um, I'll right. let you know. No worries. Ooh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, one thing that we found was very important in terms of uh, uh, communication is the importance of expertise. Uh, expertise is this central basis of this concept I mentioned earlier of critical trust. Now, critical trust is the idea, and it's captured in that uh, uh, claim or statement there from one of the public uh, focus group interviews that we did. If someone's got more specific knowledge than I have, I'm going to trust them. I don't necessarily need to fully agree with them. I don't necessarily need to like the way that they go about it. But if the person that's communicating with me has a, a depth of visible expertise and acts in a way that is knowledgeable and acts in a way that is appropriate to that knowledge, then I'm going to kind of accept, uh, accept what they're saying to a greater degree. So it's the idea of critical trust. I don't have to necessarily like the, what they say, but I kind of recognize and respect the basis on which they're saying it. And that's really the central plank of the safety profession and the way that it's understood and accepted. It's all built upwards from this idea of critical trust. So in thinking about our recommendations and within the report that we talk about now, uh, we came up with a, a number of things that we hope will be of, of use um, to you. Some of them may seem perhaps obvious, and perhaps they are, but I think it's important to state them. You know, this first one, choose your words carefully. Absolutely, of course, I'm sure you will do, but um, 
some of the testimony that we had in the focus groups and in the interviews that we did with, with key players really picked up on this, this issue of in, kind of incomprehensibility of jargon, um, which some thought was a, an issue to do with health and safety. So um, one of our interviewees, Sheila Pantry, who was a uh, head of information services at the Health and Safety Executive between 1977 and 93, said of, of some of the earlier leaflets that were being produced, you know, if a technical person wrote it, often it was not understandable, so you had to make sure it was all clear. Um, again, this idea that making sure that the people you're trying to reach are actually getting the messages you want. Um, more recently, Ruth Warden, who's part of the NHS Employers Federation, told us, Health and safety people need to be able to speak the language of the organization, not just health and safety language, because they can be quite niche and can struggle to explain and persuade others of the relevance in a broader context. So again, it's that, that, that feeling that you're kind of fitting in with the, the people on the shop floor the, uh, and also the values within the organization. You know, health and safety isn't something that is standalone, but it relates to the other aspects of an organization's work and trying to slot in health and safety with that is important. Uh, the second thing uh, in terms of expertise was the idea that sometimes you can feel afraid or, or restricted in being the expert if you are the person who has the, the most relevant or, or, or the highest amount of knowledge about an issue. Sometimes people feel uh, you know, that, that, there's a, that they have to dumb down or not present themselves as being the expert. But actually from the focus groups and from the public attitudes information we gathered, they're really knowledge breeds respect. Um, people base their decisions on the expertise that they see. Uh, and if people believe what they're saying and say what they do and do what they say, uh, then people will buy in and accept them. A really good example of this, a nice anecdote. In one of the focus groups, we asked at the, at the beginning, what, what are the things that come to mind when you think about the health and safety people where you work? And these are members of the public who come from all kinds of different backgrounds in terms of their jobs. Uh, but they all kind of said, oh, you know, jobs worth clipboard, boring, uh, interfering, uh, really strict, you can't approach them, you know, don't like them, uh, all the rest of it. Fine, this is their kind of opinions, top of the head stuff. About three, four minutes later, we came around to another question and asked them, when you think about what good health and safety experts look like, what do you want them to be like? What should they be like? for you to trust and respect them and they said well you want them to be really you want them to be really serious you want them to know exactly what they're saying you don't want to have them messing around so you want them to be quite focused you want them to be really uh you know know the detail and be really kind of nerdy about it in a way so what they said they didn't like and what they said they wanted were almost exactly the same um, and that is built around the idea of people not being afraid to be the expert Um, so, At this stage, um, would you like me to launch the, the polls, um, the results of the polls? Uh, yes, okay, please, yeah. absolutely. Yep, okay, great, not a problem. All right, uh, I've launched those for you. Okay, so in broad terms, I think people's experience seems to be uh, broadly a very a very positive one. That's 70% that somewhat or very supportive of the people in their workplace. And I suspect probably what, what you're encountering is some degree of this uh, of this tendency. Uh, that if you communicate well, present yourself as the expert, this underlying idea that people see the importance of it, uh, then that is going to carry a very long way. So that's a really kind of positive insight and a positive finding. Uh, the last thing, just in terms of expertise, is the importance of trickling it down. Now, obviously, it's a resource. It's something that's built up over time, uh, something that carries a lot of value. Uh, but like a lot of resources, sometimes we need to think about distributing it a bit more equally among our population. So just as a, an interesting kind of historical example, again, to show that these are issues that are long running and we still need to think, be thinking about addressing, um, we found a nice uh, quote of a, a safety officer um, from British Rail Days, 1970, who said that their, their design, their aim was to make, as they put it, every man his own safety officer. So this idea that they want to build those basic, basic competencies competencies in every member of the organization. Yeah, and one of the key principles that kind of came up time and again in some of the interviews we did is the idea that decisions should be made wherever possible at the lowest possible level in the organization 
where there's the competence to do so. So one example of that, we talked to uh, Lawrence Waterman, who were, was in charge of the uh, 2012 uh, London Olympic build, the biggest uh, engineering undertaking ever, ever done in the country. He gave an example of this debate that he had with construction workers about whether uh, they should be made to wear uh, safety goggles, eye protection on the construction site. And of course, the rule was that they, they should. At the same time, they were saying to him, if we're working at height and it's raining, actually, we get a lot of mist and uh, droplets on those goggles and our visibility gets a lot worse, which when you're working at height is incredibly dangerous. So how do we make a decision between those things? We have to be flexible. We have to maybe delegate some decisions down to a level where it makes sense and really rely on the insights that you can gather from people elsewhere in the organization. Okay. So one key way of doing this uh, is discussion. Uh, this is a two-way flow, so it's something that isn't top-down, but also needs to be an open discussion. We may have uh, a concern about discussing health and safety openly with people because it has been so derided in recent years, but everything that we've seen in the project research has shown that this is really, really important. Part of that is about building a space where you can have those discussions. Um, so this is that first point about building forums for discussion. Again, part of this is about encouraging people to engage with this at every level. So a place for a, a consultation. Um, one a nice example of this, again, and how important this has been and how recognised it's been for some time, is that just after the Health and Safety at Work Act, one of the Health and Safety, in fact, the Health and Safety Commission's first activity was recalled by David Ease, uh, who's later Deputy General at the HSE said that you want employers and employees representatives to agree that there is a way forward so this is why the safety committee and safety representatives regulations were one of the health and safety commission's first priorities um, it took them several years to get it through in 19, until 1977 but they did because they knew that they needed that space to bring people together to talk to work out and this is thinking about the what works where you are what practices people are using on the ground as well as what they theoretically should be doing so they kind of to capture these these informal approaches and to work out that's a great idea let's move it let's can we apply it somewhere else the second part of a conversation is obviously that it's a two-way process and sometimes that involves questioning um, now people questioning you uh, really has to be understood not as necessarily as a challenge or as a a, a barrier but actually as something that can be very positive there'll never be agreement about uh, issues to do with health and safety and in many ways all the way through our, our historical period from 1960 to the present day there have been these processes of debate negotiation working things out even down to that example I just gave um, uh, on the Olympic bit of deciding what's more important being able to see or, or having your eyes protected um, what's important in terms of questioning uh, I think uh, is the that there are opportunities for people to query uh, and ask about health and safety and how it applies to them. Because crucially, when you justify or explain something, you're, you're providing information and something that people can kind of uh, build on and, and, and use. Um, that's certainly true of the way that health and safety is represented in the media. You know, it's when it's used as an excuse to close down rather than open up a conversation that problems really arise. This is also a, a conversation that needs to be happening not just within a particular organization or workplace but but publicly as well and this is of course very difficult to do but again it's something that's long been recognized so in the early 1970s the then chief inspector of factories said it's part of the job of the inspector to develop an informed public and to harness the force of its informed opinion to the improvement of conditions so again this idea that actually the benefits of having this discussion can be very widespread um, the key thing is about being idealistic about all of these things is also to be realistic, to know what can be achieved. You might not be able to change an entire industry, a whole employer to think in a way, but you might be able to change what's done on a particular site or a process. Um, and that can be very powerful. It can demonstrate to the, the people who really need to see it that what's going on and what can be done. Though, as we say, and as you no doubt experience, you will find disagreements along the way. And the last thing is really a point about who is the champion or who is the leader 
around selling health and safety as a message because that is the basis of future performance and, and future success in health and safety is uh, being led or providing leadership for people to follow. Uh, and this is really about advocacy and persuasion, uh, convincing people of the ideas. Um, one of the things that, that there was a recent publication, the East Centre 2 um, survey, which was carried out by the European Commission about pro attitudes and uh, behaviours around health and safety across the whole of the EU. And there was a good line in there about one of their findings. They said, a change has taken place um, uh, that while we used to see um, organised labour and health and safety reps and health and safety advisors uh, having the role as activists in the past, increasingly more and more, those roles have been narrowed down a little bit to just being kind of observers, uh, the eyes of management. Uh, in terms of seeing what's going on and spotting problems, rather than actually acting as, as advocates, as uh, thought leaders, uh, and making the case that, that health and safety matters. And crucially, we found as well, there's a lot of scope for doing that in ways that are not just limited to the business case, that this is efficient, or that it, it, you get a return for each pound that you invest, but also to think of it in moral terms. Uh, a right to safety can be drawn on and be stated, um, it's important for people who are working in the area, uh, who, who, who value health and safety, to show that their motives are good, that they are altruistic, that they're doing things for the right reason. That really came through from the focus groups and public attitude information. If you're doing it for the right reasons, people will follow you. It also came through from debates around FIFA intervention, um, the, the more recent policy that HSC has introduced about charging. Uh, for advice and input where they find a breach of the law. Why, they, why is that so controversial? Because all of a sudden it looks like an inspector may not be being purely altruistic in the advice or the insights that they give. The last thing we were going to mention, which is just to finish on, is obviously the response to the wider world from here onwards. We're in the middle of a process uh, of Brexit, which is going to have very fundamental implications for everybody who works in this area and everything that we do. But what those implications are is really something that we don't necessarily yet know with any degree of clarity. I don't think even the people in government know with any degree of clarity what the future holds around Brexit. Some things are clear though about it. Firstly, there will be a policy process and that will need engagement from people who are informed and have expertise uh, and who can push that in the right direction. To give you an example, there are 8,000 statutes, uh, statutory instruments and regulations taken from Europe uh, in UK law that will need to be rolled over and reviewed as part of the Brexit process. Even if they get two hours debate at parliamentary level each, that's a full parliamentary term of five years uh, of full-time work of scrutiny about those regulations. So somebody is going to have to try and steer that in a, in a way that is positive and constructive. And that comes down really to people who believe in it, who are active at the front line and have the knowledge and expertise to raise their voice for health and safety. Secondly, more broadly, it's a time when we're questioning a lot of different things. People are questioning the kind of society that they want to live in, uh, how we balance different considerations. So that gives you an opportunity perhaps to raise some interesting questions with people you work with. What do you want the future to be? Because you don't know, and I don't know, and they don't know what the future will be. But you're in a good position, perhaps, to ask them questions about how they weigh up what they might like the future to look like. And lastly, it's just worth aspiring back to the idea of public attitudes again. The EU is a good example in this area. Widely something that's highly criticised, seen as highly uh, controversial, interfering, meddling, uh, unwelcome. That was, you know, came through in a lot of the debates around the Brexit process. In a way, health and safety over the last 10 years has been kind of like Brexit in miniature. You have this distrust of experts, a concern about regulation being imposed, uh, uh, a kind of resistance to red tape, uh, and so on and so forth, and a, a media campaign that is very negative. But health and safety has kind of endured and come through the other side uh, because people see it as broadly a positive thing. Actually, we found in our, our public uh, attitude surveys, people didn't necessarily see the EU as the culprit in all of this. Uh, they placed the, the responsibility elsewhere, which is why 
you know, the, the irony in that particular photo, the man who tried to burn the EU flag, he couldn't do it because uh, EU regulations about flammable, uh, flamm flammable fabrics meant that the flag wouldn't actually catch fire. So that brings us to the end. Uh, the way to get through it, uh, to change attitudes, is all about communication and conversation. Thank you very much for your uh, time and your attention. Uh, and we very much welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, okay, great. Well, thank you very much for that both. Um, that was really, in, uh, really informative. <clears throat> uh, we do actually have quite a number of questions that have come through. Uh, so I'm going to go through these um, chronologically, really. Um, so the first question that has come through is actually uh, relating back to the first survey question that uh, was asked about social attitudes towards health and safety. Um, is the social attitude critical to corporate attitudes? Uh, because I feel that corporate attitude is better and more important. So what do you, what do you guys think? It's a double-edged sword. And one of, the, one of the phrases that is often used to describe this uh, is the idea of a social license to operate. So the idea of the social license is that businesses kind of have a stake in how they're seen by wider society. And in general terms, if wider society demands that people do things or businesses do things in a particular way, um, then uh, businesses will, in, will take that on board and factor it into the decision making that they make. So the social license is much broader actually than public attitudes or even media attitudes. It does go down to things like uh, a commitment to the rule of law, a commitment to uh, uh, regulation, the ability to trade across Europe, where we have common, for now at least, we have common regulatory uh, regimes, uh, the ability to show that you're a responsible organization, uh, and so on and so forth. So all of those things, I think, uh, factor in and, and generally tend to mean that, that the attitudes of organizations tend to be a bit more positive perhaps than the ones from the public that we might read uh, in the or, the, or the attitudes that we might read in the media. Just to, to add something very quickly on that one, this, this interaction between pro public attitudes, broadly speaking, and what employers and organizations are doing, it, again, is a long-standing one. Um, people tried to harness this in the 19th century, uh, for example, in the railway industry to push them to improve and avoid crashes and so on. Um, but again, we've seen it throughout and really becoming kind of quite critical and quite important in the 1980s um, in how it acts, not just with the, um, uh, not just on organizations, but on the state as well, and how they then interact with businesses. So there's a very complex way in which all of these factors are linking together. And actually, one thing that many people said uh, kind of historically about the politics of health and safety was there have been times, you know, since the, since the 1974 Act when we think the government would have quite liked to have rolled it back. They would have liked to have deregulated a lot more than they did. And the reason they didn't is that employers actually didn't want them to. They didn't push for it through their, the commission uh, or through uh, responses to consultations uh, or other sources. So uh, actually, I think... It, 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 you're quite right to make that distinction and that, that organisation attitudes do tend to be different than what we call public attitudes. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for that one. The next question we've got here is, uh, was there any attempt to look at international comparison? So, for example, in Australia and in uh, other northern European countries, uh, there's not been the same media coverage of this whole health and safety gone mad. Um, and there does not seem to be the same kind of public hostility there. So we did think about that. We were looking just at the UK, although we paid reference to a more European um, context, again, using some of the um, European social surveys that have been produced by the EU over the years because they gave us a reasonable run of, of data. And again, that's something that the, the Nottingham team were, were very helpful in uh, going through and dealing with. Um, but we were really thinking about the, the UK context. Um, although, again, how far we can divorce that from the EU um, mm. is a big question. Yeah, it seems very clear, actually, that, that, that things are different in other places. And when you try to pull that apart and why that might be, uh, it can be it can be for many different reasons. So, for instance, there's a lot of material out there about the way that OSHA is seen in North America or the United States. 
if we think that the public acceptance of, of, of HSE and health and safety in the UK has been a bumpy ride, OSHA uh, has been kind of public enemy number one, particularly kind of in the, the sort of Reagan era of the 1980s. Uh, there, the, the politics was, was different, but was even more perhaps critical uh, than it has been here. Um, with Australia, what's interesting there is that uh, the way that they kind of frame and talk about uh, what we call health and safety is very much more framed around workplace safety uh, or occupational safety. So they, they, they kind of position it in a slightly different way. Uh, and for that reason, don't get into some of the, those issues about uh, the breadth of coverage or new areas or watering down, as it might be perceived, of what health and safety means. They have kind of slightly clearer message, and that maybe helps to shore it up. And across the rest of Europe, um, it's very variable, but what you tend to see, particularly around northern European countries, uh, is that there's perhaps a greater residual acceptance of regulation more generally. You know, people people have a slightly different attitude towards the state, and there may be a bit less kind of inherently uh, uh, critical uh, or inherently suspicious of it uh, for many different kind of cultural uh, and historical and political reasons. So we did a bit of comparison, but the, the study itself was mainly UK. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for clarifying that one. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, there's a couple of questions here in relation to the uh, the tragedy at Grenfell Tower. Um, these are both in relation to uh, change in legislation. So, basically, what they're saying is questions have already been asked about um, health and safety, and obviously the fire in London this week. Uh, will this mean a tightening of legislations uh, and regulations in the future so will it change those legislations and will it put uh, health and safety professionals under scrutiny well uh, obviously it's it's kind of difficult to to second guess what the what the outcome of ongoing processes and investigations will be but as I've sort of watched the media coverage, I've been really struck by some of the parallels to events that we looked at in the past in our uh, in our study. So for instance, Piper Alpha, which is the main kind of fire or, or, or inflagration related event from the past. Piper Alpha had a huge influence for the good uh, for health and safety in the United Kingdom. It, it really shored up uh, acceptance of regulation in this area at a time when it might otherwise have been politically quite vulnerable at the end of the 1980s. Obviously, no one wants to say that, that these kind of disasters are, are, are in any way good things, but often one of the outcomes of them uh, is that if you think about there being a sort of cycle that, that we go through as a society, that we regulate something, then we get a bit tired of having regulated it, then we get hostile to the regulations and we deregulate it, and then maybe something goes wrong, and then we are really worried and we regulate it again. If we think about that kind of cycle as one that does recur all the way through, you know, the historical period that we looked at, I think we're at the moment now where we're starting to see people saying, actually, have we gone too far in deregulating? Have we gone too far in, in, in giving responsibility to people that we don't necessarily check up on or, or follow up on? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'd see it less as a cycle and more as a pendulum swinging from, from one extreme to, not extreme, but from one side to the other in terms of the, the regulation, deregulation side of things. And again, we have seen uh, from the historical examples that um, you kind of, you might frame some legislation and then it's, it's found wanting. So people start to think, oh, is there enough going on here? And then you, eventually you do reach a tipping point where there is enough or so, either a particular disastrous event or enough smaller events that people say, right, enough is enough. We're going to start to try and change what we're doing here and tweak it a bit, tweak it a bit, tweak it a bit. Sometimes it comes to the point, arguably, as in 1974, where you say, right, well, this, this, the whole system is not working as it should. Let's change the whole system. I don't think we're at the point of changing the whole system uh, with what's happened in Grimple Tower, but um, I would be very surprised if there weren't some further changes and again potentially this would help the pendulum swing back towards uh, towards slightly more regulation. And in a way it's kind of, uh, uh, as I intimated earlier, it, it's kind of significant I think that it has occurred so close to the start of the Brexit negotiations within, within a week of the start of those negotiations with Brussels about the, the kind of future that we want as a country and the kind of balance between 
regulation and deregulation that we want. Um, you know, Grenfell Tower has really put that question back at the forefront of the minds, perhaps, of policymakers, of the public, uh, and of other people too, uh, in a way that that we might suggest would would perhaps contribute to slightly different outcomes um, than we might otherwise have seen. So, uh, events obviously are, are significant because of the impact that they have. The other side of it, of course, is 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 the question of of kind of responsibility and culpability. Um, I've heard the phrase corporate manslaughter being used already in relation to, to Grenfell Tower this week. Uh, obviously, that legislation is nearly 10 years old and it's never been used uh, in a case uh, of, of the kind of scale of disaster that we're looking at now, uh, or indeed of things like the Herald of Free Enterprise or Piper Alpha uh, or Labrick Grove or things that happened in the past that led to it being introduced. So um, I think there will be, again, a, a turn towards questioning the role of enforcement uh, and the role of, of punishment uh, and criminal liability uh, in the area. Um, and that will obviously, I think, you know, potentially lead to degrees of scrutiny for, for people who manage fire risks in particular, but health and safety more generally that they might have to respond to. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just quickly, could you just uh, twist your laptop a little bit, just because we can see more of Mike, um, maybe push it back a little bit further so that that's better. Um, okay, great. It's just you, uh, unfortunately, you're slightly off the off the side of the, the, the camera. Um, okay, we've got another question here. Uh, so why hasn't anybody developed a more understandable and public friendly uh, REMS for musculoskeletal disorders? Well, um, yeah, can I, yeah, I suspect partly because this is a relatively new area um, within the whole health and safety sphere. Uh, yes, I know it's well established now, but um, given enough time, uh, as I said earlier, these are, are things that are gradually built over time. Um, and when we identify as a problem, people aren't understanding it because um, whatever the reasons. In this case, I suspect because it is highly technical, highly medical, highly difficult to get at that all of the circumstances involved over time I suspect we will get to that point uh, but just not yet yeah one thing that I, I comes to mind from one of the interviews we did which I think was with Jenny Bacon who was director general of HSE from the late 90, 1995 to 2000 I think um, she said you know part of the reason that health tends to lag behind safety is that that in many ways health is hard you know, health issues are hard, they're diffuse, they're complex, the relationship between cause and effect is often much more indirect than might be the case in relation to say uh, machine guarding or storage of chemicals or something like that, that, that is a more physical kind of safety risk. So part of the reason is musculoskeletal disorders, you know, uh, uh, psychosocial risk factors like stress and things like that, they're hard, they're hard to get right. Um, and they involve thinking about many different variables that interact often in, in, in ways that are quite hard to quantify uh, and nail down. So the, uh, the, the guidance that tends to be given either has to be quite general because it's a statement of, of the, the direction you're traveling, if not a, a detailed map of how to get there, uh, or it has to be kind of full of kind of caveats and if X, then Y, and if, if not Y, then Z, and, and, and ways of, of, of complexity to try and make them work across all the different areas that they have to apply to. So it, it's a big challenge, but it's perhaps one that is in some ways slightly inherent to the, to the, the sphere of health. Okay, great. Um, admittedly, we are actually coming towards the end of our time here, but do, do you guys mind staying on for a little bit longer? Um, just to answer no, a few no. more questions, if, if that's okay. Any more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, just because we, we've, got, we've got a few more. Um, obviously, I appreciate that not, uh, not everyone might be able to stay for these, so just to put your mind at ease, this session is being recorded, so you can always play this back at a later stage. Um, we, tend, we tend to stick to time, but on this occasion we do have quite a number of questions that i would quite like to go through if possible so uh, we'll just we'll just continue running for a little bit longer um if that's okay um so the next question then uh was with regards to uh 
Lawrence Waterman and uh, basically what was the outcome of Lawrence Waterman's discussion on safety glasses during the Olympic project? Well, um, I'm sure Lawrence himself would be would be the person to talk to about the specifics of it. But uh, from my recollection of the interview that we did with him, I'm pretty sure that what he said was, you know, it is about reasonable practicability at the end of the day. And that means that you decide kind of what you think is best in the place where you have to work. Uh, and you decide, you know, what is in a way, in that case, not quite the lesser of two evils, but what's the best way forward? Uh, and I think he said, you know, it's about being pragmatic. It's about weighing up different things. And it's about taking those soundings from the people who know best. And that's the guys who are, uh, you know, on top of ladders at the top of the Olympic Stadium, wearing goggles that they can't see through. What do they need? What do they want in that moment? Uh, crucially, importantly, he said, that is to be able to see what they're doing. I'm fairly sure we had a very similar um, example with one of the interviews with, uh, with the rail in, in the rail industry of track workers um, not being able to see because of the uh, wet goggles. Um, yeah. So they these kind are, of, you know, big in issues. In that case, narrow your field yeah. of vision yeah. and your ability to hear and or see an oncoming train. So yeah. how do you weigh those two things up? Well, I think avoiding the train is probably priority yeah. number one and 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 the goggles may be a priority number two oh, it's, it's interesting because it ties back into that issue of, of the well you can decide on the ground but then if something does happen later on someone else may come to a different conclusion and you'd like to come to a different conclusion it's, it's very very difficult to balance those two things which is one of these issues that, that creates that uncertainty that, that people don't tend to like you know they do like and something that came out in some of the focus groups, in some of the interviews, and in the, the um, archival material, it's much easier to be told exactly what you need to do and when you need to do it. This that degree of flexibility and being able to interpret, people find quite difficult to deal with. And yeah. again, there isn't a good solution, I don't think, to that. Yeah. Health and safety in a way, it, it's not really maths, it's social science in a way. You know, in a maths exam, there's a yeah. right answer to the question. And if you work it out and you give the right number, you've got it right. With health and safety, it's a bit more like a, maybe a history exam or a, or a law exam where we sort of set questions about what do you think is the right balance of, of considerations? On, on How would you argue about this? And you can quite often look at that and say, well, I don't think this person's reached the right conclusion in terms of what they think about you know, the, the effect of the poor laws or whatever else it is that you're teaching them in history or in law. Uh, but I can see through the way that they've mm. got there, the way that they've balanced the, the resources and the information that they have, that they've kind of followed the right steps. They've made a good quality decision, even if the outcome of it is one that I do or do not think is the same as the one that I would make. So it's, it's kind of, you know, how it, it, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it in a way. It's, it's how you get to where you're going sometimes is the most important thing. Okay, great. Um, there's a very quick one here that uh, just basically with regards to the EU report that you mentioned. Um, can the document be published? Are, are they allowed to use it and send it out? Uh, absolutely. It's, it's freely available on the uh, European Commission's website, but I'm sure in the, the, the materials that we, we distribute following this, we can, we can place a link to the ESNA 2 report. As I said, it's a, it's a huge piece of work. It's a, the, the report itself is a good 100, 135 pages long, very detailed kind of survey of attitudes and behaviours across Europe. Uh, we're more than happy to link to that, but it is a, a publicly available document, so that should be easy to do. Okay, great. Um, so we've got a question here that uh, so you mentioned the role of enforcers be, uh, being uh, to engage and inform the public. Um, so the question really is, can you make uh, any comment on whether you consider uh, whether this has been challenged by the changes in operations at HSE, uh, particularly in respect to uh, fee for intervention? Well, um, I think there are, there, are, there are kind of many things that, that, that constitute barriers or, or challenges for HSE in performing that, that role as a kind of public uh, informing body, a public engaging body. Um, to some degree, we've seen much more kind of proactivity in public engagement in the last seven or eight years, perhaps, than, than, than any time before, at least with 
what we would call the general public. Mm. Uh, and you see that through, you know, social media, but also things like Mythbuster yeah. challenge panels and, and things like that. So a lot of work is being done on that. Uh, in terms of it as an advisory and engagement role for, for the kind of stakeholders and duty holders and people who work in the field of health and safety as their job, uh, there is a big implication uh, off the back of uh, a FIFA intervention. I don't think it's controversial to say uh, that those challenges are ones that, that HSC is fully aware of. Certainly Martin Temple, when he did his triennial review of, how, uh, of HSC in 2014, said uh, FIFA intervention is a big challenge. It has to be managed in the right way so that people see what we're doing. And it, it goes back to that point we made about altruistic motives. You know, uh, The challenge for it is that anybody might think to themselves, well, why are HSE doing this? Why are they saying what they're saying? And maybe questioning it in a way that they didn't before. Whether that is actually reflective of any change in HSE's attitude to what they do it is kind of a completely different question. But uh, the big challenge, I think, for, for the organization in, in doing a kind of fee-based uh, pay-as-you-go kind of approach to enforcement um, is, uh, is that one of trust and belief. Uh, it's certainly a challenge that I think HSC knows that it has and is reviewing as it goes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we'll we'll go. We'll have a, a couple more. Um, I am aware of time, but uh, so the next one here is: uh, What impact, if any, uh, do you think civil litigation changes have made to the perception of health and safety? Well, a, a huge impact, actually. Um, going back to the focus groups that we did, um, it was very clear that you could kind of, as I said, you go through this process, you get the opinion, which is, oh, it's all rubbish, health and safety interfering. Blah, blah, blah. Then the more you talk about what people value and what, what matters to them uh, and where they work and so on, you see people move to a position where they talk about that critical trust, that their underlying attitudes are quite positive. But there are these kind of pools or areas of kind of, they're almost like public attitude kryptonite in terms of people's acceptance of health and safety and civil litigation, in particular the relationship between uh, health and safety and compensation mm. for injury was a real one of those. People are much more kind of uh, instinctively quite judgmental, I think, about it and censorious in a way that, you know, it, people who, who are claiming it, they, they tend to be, you know, trying to make a fast buck. Uh, the people involved in it tend to, to lack kind of uh, a decency and morality in the way that they do it. People would be very negative about, about it. But interestingly, again, even there, you see that pendulum between attitudes and opinions, because this is a good one. We had one focus group. We were talking to people. It was in the, it was in the sort of greater London area. And they're talking about compensation and how, you know, uh, people put it in for any old reason and, you know, it, isn't it terrible? And they're all, you know, trying to scrounge some, some money for nothing. And then one of the people in the group said, well, actually a couple of years ago, you know, I was riding this, this bus at an airport, transfer bus, and the, the bus didn't stop properly uh, or, or it drove off before I'd got on and I fell and, and cracked my ankle. And I put in a claim and I got this money and, and it was really helpful because I was off work and it w otherwise I would have had to fund it myself. All of a sudden there's this kind of, what, are, what they call in politics terms, pivot and bridge in the attitudes of everybody else, which is they kind of turn around from where they were and say, well, of course, in your case, that's a really genuine claim. Of course, when it's serious stuff like that, it really matters. Of course, while you're sat in the room with me, I'm not going to tell you to your face that you're a sponger. Um, but crucially, I, it, it does depend on, on, on how real those issues are made for people when they engage with them. In that situation, they had a real example and a real person, and nobody had a problem with that real example. It's when people are framing it through the lens of, of, of kind of uh, the front page of the Daily Mail, talking about this massive spike in compensation culture, that it gets problematic. And underneath that, the data that's there seems to suggest that, that that perception is not necessarily one that's completely true. So it has a huge impact, yeah. Did, uh, I can't remember the focus groups, did the, the role of the insurance industry come up at all? Because I know we interviewed uh, yeah. some from the insurance industry. Yeah. The, this is related. Yeah, one of, the, one of the other themes that we looked at 
uh, or, or set of actors and, and issues is that of insurance, because that is also kind of related to, should we say, monetization of safety, um, it, it, rather than post hoc, which is what compensation comes in after the event you settle up the costs and the, the, the liabilities. Insurance is kind of pre hoc, it's before you, where you settle up the balance of risk, but you do it in a financial exchange. Um, insurance was seen as uh, also as a potential driver of, uh, of, of of problems with health and safety. People have very negative attitudes about the insurance industry. When we spoke to people who worked in the insurance industry, uh, I think they were based at Zurich, who are the, the kind of biggest um, uh, employers liability insurer in the country. Uh, they made the point that actually, you know, this is a battle that we're facing all the time, and we're trying to provide a service, but uh, but people are instinctively perhaps wary about our motives for doing so. I don't think any of us necessarily are, are kind of well inclined towards our insurers for our car or our, our, our home contents or whatever else it might be, particularly when we see that the, you know, the, the way that the, the premiums shift from year to year. Um, but again, the conflict there is one around motives, around perceived motives, um, and also being a step removed from health and safety issues uh, tending to look at them in a much more kind of quantified bottom line kind of way which is how insurance has to work that's how it how it works but that kind of lends a perception of a kind of calculating coldness uh, of decision making that comes from the insurance industry uh, the young review uh, in 2010 which was not necessarily a particularly good piece um, of government uh, review and, and and policy work around health and safety did really zero in on insurance as an issue and I know that the insurance industry found that that was actually uh, quite problematic for them in terms of uh, some of the recommendations that were made. But insurance, certainly uh, another big driver of negative public attitudes. OK, great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with one, one more final question, um, I think, and, and then we'll have to probably end it there. Um, <clears throat> this question is, uh, again, coming back to the Grenfell Tower uh, incident. Um, do you feel, uh, from the perspective of the public, uh, that uh, this incident has highlighted just how important health and safety actually is? And do you see social attitudes changing uh, because of it? I think it's interesting at the moment from what I've seen of the media coverage um, they've been talking about in some respects quite technical stuff you know fire regulations building regs and so on um, but they haven't really made that connection certainly the bits I've seen to health and safety more generally um, I mean it's it should be blindingly obvious that this is a health and safety issue um, but I don't know whether that connection is being made in the minds of the public um, yeah, it's not up to the media to make that connection necessarily, although that would help, I feel. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've seen quite a few uh, media stories and pieces of coverage that had, that had sort of said, you know, made the point, this is what happens when you cut red tape. Yes. And uh, I'm kind of not necessarily talking about health and safety, but talking generally about deregulation as, you know, a decision that you make as a society that you're going to tolerate certain things and trade off the cost of, of regulating something versus the, the benefits or the potential risks that come when you don't. Um, so I think there is a sort of sense that some of those trade-offs and, and that way of balancing competing, what we might call them public goods, you know, the, 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 the right to have uh, a business that is profitable, that employs people, that is successful, that isn't tied up in red tape versus the right of people who interact with that business or work for it to be safe. Um, the same in, in terms of social housing, uh, the same in terms of things like perhaps transport uh, and other areas. Uh, and actually, interesting, there's probably a parallel there too um, with other tragedies that we've seen in recent times around things like, uh, like terrorism and anti-terror measures, because they also involve this trading off of different, uh, different uh, considerations some of which involve restriction and some of which involve protection and um, as a society we're kind of having those conversations one way or another all the time so i think Grenfell Tower will impact beyond just the the kind of narrow issue of of fire safety and um, perhaps in terms of making us think about 
how we balance those things. As I said, with, with Brexit uh, negotiations happening uh, on Monday next week, it, it puts perhaps a different issue, set of issues or set of debates at the forefront of politicians' minds as they go into that process. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much to the, the both of you. Um, I think uh, that was a really good session. Uh, and obviously we, we have run over. There are a, a few outstanding questions, but um, people are starting to filter out. So I think if, if it's okay with you, the questions that remain unanswered, I will we'll, we'll have a look at them at a later stage and possibly maybe put some uh, written responses which can go along with the recording, if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, it's, great. It's it really is an area that 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 poses questions and and gets people going in terms of in terms of debate and talking about how things have changed over time. So we're absolutely happy to be part of that yeah. that discussion with people. Yeah. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Okay. Well, in that case, on uh, I will put these into in, obviously into something for you and, and send it over. Um, Thank you to everyone who has sat in on this session and attended it. As I mentioned earlier, this has been recorded and will be posted online um, at some point early next week, I would imagine. If you do have any queries, obviously you can email myself. Um, my email address is ben.pollard at iosh.com. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions at all, just get in touch and we'll be able to respond to you directly. But otherwise, uh, all left really for me to say is uh, thank you very much to, to Mike and Paul uh, for delivering a, a fantastic session. Yeah, and thank you. Well, Thanks thank to the audience you, yeah. and, and everybody who attended. Thank you all. Brilliant. Okay, well, I'm going to close the meeting now. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, hopefully see you all uh, at the next one.